Hey everybody, uh, today we're going to talk about Dwight D. Eisenhower um, specifically and kind of generally going to talk about the 1950s in America. Uh, I'm going to do two lectures on this, so this is the first of the two. The second one's going to get a little bit more into the prosperity and, and deal specifically with uh, women in the 1950s for this week's discussion board post. Okay, later this week I'll be doing a, a civil rights lecture as well and, and I'll incorporate some videos into that lecture. But uh, today, let's talk a little bit about Eisenhower and his presidency from 1952 to 1960. First of all, Eisenhower was uh, an incredibly popular president at the time. Uh, if you recall, we knew uh, Eisenhower, Dwight David Eisenhower, Ike for short. Ike was a, a, an abbreviation of his last name. <clears throat> he was a popular war hero, um, the general behind D-Day, uh, a very popular uh, leader, and he called his style a dynamic conservatism. He tended to be liberal on social issues and conservative on fiscal issues. Um, he is the president that is responsible for continuing and extending the New Deal, right? So now is the Republicans' opportunity to get rid of FDR's New Deal if they wanted to, uh, but he pragmatically accepted it and legitimized it. And so many of the programs, things like Social Security uh, and those types of programs, were um, considered to be now a part of modern America, right? Largely because he didn't make any efforts to really undo them, okay? Um, that was the question. Uh, think of kind of a current situation that's similar to that with Obamacare, right? So we had this uh, National Health Care Act. Was it gonna last? Was it not gonna last? Uh, and President Trump made uh, big efforts to repeal it. The Supreme Court has gone after it, and I guess it's still kind of an open question. Had President Trump come in and said, you know what, I don't like it, but it is what it is, then it would have legitimized uh, Obamacare. Okay. Uh, another major act that you just need to be aware of during Eisenhower's presidency that was passed by Congress was the Interstate Highway Act. And this is a massive undertaking in the United States. So this is the Highway Act that leads to the highway system that we have today that I think at one point was considered one of the modern wonders of the world. Uh, it's, it's amazing. If you were to pull out of the parking lot at Carmel High School on Highway 1, the United States is so connected by highways that you could get to pretty much any city you wanted to on major highways. <clears throat> so uh, massive, massive highway system built. Why did we spend so much money to build a massive highway system? Well, it was all about defense. This is a Cold War context. We wanted to be able to mobilize our massive military. Think of the Panama Canal and helping to get our Navy from the east to the west coast. This was going to help us to mobilize our military if we needed to highway systems. Think about the overpasses on highways, way higher than any uh, car or truck in the 1950s, but uh, would accommodate uh, military convoys, right? Uh, every so often, there are huge straight stretches of highway that can serve as landing strips. So this was an incredibly intentional system that was uh, presented as necessary to the national defense. So you may not think that as you're driving the highways across the country, but it was um, it was an act that was seen as necessary to our national defense. Makes a lot of sense. Has a lot of consequences, unintended consequences as well. If you've ever seen the Pixar movie Cars, you know what happens to all those uh, small towns that used to be on uh, the old um, highways before the interstates. Uh, they get passed by, and it really starts to change the the dynamics of the United States and concentrate population even more in these large cities. The numbering system of highways all has uh, a rhyme and a reason to it. It's it's really an incredible thing. Uh, I would encourage you to go out and do a little bit of research on the Interstate Highway Act. It is a pretty remarkable achievement. Okay, in 1953, Joseph Stalin has died. And Eisenhower gives a speech, and I, I, I want to read this because I think it gives you a sense of Eisenhower's perspective. Um, this is the type of perspective that you get when you're a, a commander sending people to die in World War II. So here's what, uh, what he says. Um, bear with me. I'm going to read it. It says, every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies in the final sense a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. This world in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hopes of its children. The cost of one modern heavy bomber is this, a modern brick school in more than 30 cities. 
It is two electric power plants, each serving a town of 60,000 population. It is two fine, fully equipped hospitals. It is some 50 miles of concrete pavement. We pay for a single fighter with a half a million bushels of wheat. We pay for a single destroyer with new homes that could have, could have housed more than 8,000 people. This is not a way of life at all in any true sense. Under the cloud of threatening war, it is humanity hanging from a cross of iron. Right? So this is going to be a big warning from Eisenhower at the end of his presidency in 1960. He's going to warn against something called the military industrial complex. We'll come back to that in a second. But I think it's interesting. He sees an opportunity and he gives a speech. It doesn't work out, but he sees an opportunity to move towards peace, to try and end the Cold War. And it's interesting that he does it by suggesting that we would all be better off if we did not spend so much money on our military preparing for this Cold War. All right, so he does this comparison. And it, it's, it's amazing. We'll look at the numbers uh, in, uh, in a bit uh, in terms of what we are spending on military, even today in a non-Cold War context. All right, <clears throat> so his foreign policy at the time um, is crafted by his advisors, a guy by the name of John Foster Dulles, uh, proposes a new look foreign policy. He says, we don't need to just contain uh, communism, but we should roll back communism. We should cut military spending. We should expand our strategic air command, and we should prepare massive retaliation. Guarantee our enemies. If they attack us, we will attack them and we will destroy them. Uh, trying to um, be more efficient in our response to communism and also be more aggressive. Eisenhower doctrine. Eisenhower has some policies uh, that, that become known as Eisenhower doctrine. He is going to support, just like Truman had in Greece and Turkey, Middle Eastern countries that are going to resist communism. Uh, he does this in Iran, arguably, to prevent Iran from falling to communism. Um, very interesting coup. Uh, I believe it's called Operation Ajax. Um, and ultimately, it's going to set up the reign of the Shah that will lead to a revolution in 1979. We'll come back to that uh, in a few weeks when we talk about the Iranian revolution. Uh, but it supported in 1953, I believe it was, a coup in Iran to install the Shah. The Shah, the king of Iran, uh, had been a uh, – he had reigned but not ruled. Uh, and there was a prime minister and a democratically elected uh, body that was that was ruling, and the United States is going to support the overthrow of the democratically elected prime minister and the installment of the Shah, all in the name of uh, preventing Iran from falling to communism. Now it gets a lot more complicated than that. If you're interested in this type of history, this is uh, the first time the the Central Intelligence Agency had um, overthrown a democratically elected leader. Uh, or worked to do so. It's a fascinating story. If you're interested, it, it involves intrigue and um, British oil interests in Iran. Uh, and there's a lot of questionable motives. Um, but it, it will also create, um, you know, for, kind of for our purposes today here, it's going to create some massive resentment in Iran for the United States. Right, that, that we toppled their uh, democratically elected regime in favor of a Shah uh, or a king ruler that would be friendly to the United States and to Britain. All right, um, <clears throat> moving forward, we see the beginnings of the space race during Eisenhower's presidency, Sputnik 1 and Sputnik 2. That is Sputnik 1 right there. It's about the size of a basketball, and it is the first Soviet satellite's first man-made satellite to orbit the Earth, um, and it freaked us out. Americans were uh, going outside to see it fly by at night, wondering if it could see us, if it could hear us. Um, and it appeared to most Americans, or many Americans anyways, that the Soviets were ahead. They had drawn first blood in the space race. And that is the beginnings of what becomes known as rocket fever in America. Um, NASA kicks into full gear. We start pumping out satellites. Math and science education becomes the most important thing that you can study. Um, we saw... Uh, the movie that we watched at the beginning of the semester, uh, Hidden Figures, kind of gets really into this space race idea. Um, for our purposes, too, it's one of the reasons that math and science education becomes so emphasized. 
right? To the detriment maybe of the humanities. And, and, you know, I could talk all day about that. Not that math and science are not important. Clearly they are, but that uh, a lot of times we've neglected the humanities, in my humble opinion, in a way that has led us to not be very thoughtful about how we use our math and science. Um, so, but this is kind of the beginnings of that kind of push, got to be an engineer, got to develop math skills, science skills, do it for your country, uh, to quote one famous math teacher at Carmel High School, right? That we want to be at the forefront of the, uh, the world's race for technological developments. Okay. Uh, here at home, domestic policy is really during Eisenhower's presidency, dominated by the civil rights movement. So I want to watch a video. Uh, I'm going to let it play. Obviously, you can skip it if you want to. Um, but we're going to, during this time period, we're going to have Brown versus Board of Education in 1954 is going to overturn the Plessy versus Ferguson precedent of separate but equal. Um, finally, after years and years of compiling data and uh, collecting examples of black schools being inferior to white schools, uh, the Supreme Court agrees to hear a case. And um, one of the groundbreaking arguments that was made is that you cannot have uh, a, a racially segregated school system that will be equal. It is always and inherently unequal. And there was a psychological study done where psychologists would talk to black school children and they would show them dolls, white dolls and black dolls. And they would ask the school children, point to the smart doll and the black school children would point to the white doll, point to the um, successful doll, the beautiful doll, always pointing to the white doll. Then they would ask, point to the stupid doll, point to the ugly doll, and they would always point to the black doll. And the argument was, you cannot, you cannot segregate people on the basis of race and expect them to not develop a sense of inferiority. Black students were not being told by their parents or teachers that they were inferior. They didn't have to be told that because the government was telling them that every day. The structure of the society that they lived in was telling them that every day. Okay, so Brown versus Board of Education, the Supreme Court agrees, uh, and the Supreme Court uh, will tell schools, and then it starts this snowball effect, but will tell schools that they cannot be segregated. They, they agree with this argument that in the sphere of education, separate but equal is inherently unequal. You cannot do it. It has too much of a detrimental effect on the groups that you are separating from each other. All right, so major victory, huge civil rights moment, um, but it's just the beginning. It is not the end, right? And Eisenhower is frustrated by this. Eisenhower, uh, you know, wants the civil rights movement to progress, but he doesn't want it to dominate his presidency. He doesn't want it uh, to be forced upon the southern states. He wants them to come around to it, and that's going to be the big tension. And he'll get pushed. We'll see in, in our lecture later this week. He'll get pushed to the point where he has to get involved, um, but it takes a lot of pushing. All right. What I want to talk about now is, is kind of another moment that sparks the civil rights movement as we know it. And this is the case of Emmett Till uh, in 1955, a year after Brown versus Board of Education, positive movement in the courts, but people's hearts and minds are not changing. And Emmett Till is going to be a spark that sets off the powder keg that is the uh, civil rights movement of the 1950s. So I want you to, to watch a little bit of a video uh, on Emmett Till. I will warn you, there's some graphic images in this uh, video. Emmett Till, just a, a quick uh, bit of the story. Emmett Till is going to be brutally murdered, basically for saying, um, whistling at or saying bye, baby, to a white woman in Money, Mississippi. Um, and his mother chooses, after they recover his body, he's unrecognizable, um, his mother chooses to have an open casket at the funeral and have pictures of his face on uh, northern newspapers as a way to, um, to infuriate uh, the conscience of Americans. So, so uh, as, as you watch this video, they will show um, his face, the picture of his face that was shown in, in newspapers. And I'll give you a, a warning when that's coming up, just in case you don't want to want to see it. But it was, um, it was an image that started a movement. Okay, so about 10 minutes long, uh, go ahead and skip if you'd like, or you can come back and watch this at some other time. On August 21st, 
1955, two teenagers from Chicago boarded a train and traveled south to visit family in Mississippi. We was going on there to pick some cotton because I'd never picked any cotton before. And I was looking forward to do that because I had told my mother that I could pick 200 pounds. And she told me I could, you know. So we was going on there and look for a good time, you know. For more than a year, racial tensions in the South had been higher than usual. Since the Supreme Court ruled in Brown versus Board of Education that segregated schools were unconstitutional. The decision touched a raw nerve in the white South and many organized to preserve white supremacy. For years, groups like the Ku Klux Klan practiced terrorism. Despite national black protests, public murders of blacks were common and the mobs who committed them went unpunished. In the previous 70 years, there had been more than 500 documented lynchings in Mississippi alone. Coming from Chicago, Curtis Jones and his cousin Emmett Till had little sense of the world they were entering when they arrived in Money, Mississippi. Emmett Till was, at the time, he was 14 years old. Hey, there's a graduate out of grammar school. She had some picture of some white kids that he had graduated from. That was, you know, female and male. So he told the boys down there, you know, hey, you got around the store? This must have been around about maybe 10 to 12, you know, youngsters around there, that the girls was his girlfriend, you know. So one of the, the local boys said, hey, there's a girl in that store there, so I bet you want to go in there and talk to her, you know. So he went in there to you know, get some candy. So when he was leaving out the store, after buying the candy, he told us, said, bye, baby. And the next thing I knew, one of the boys came up to me and say, uh, say, man, you got a crazy cousin. He just went in there and said bye to that white woman. And that's when, um, this man I was playing checker with, this older man, I guess he must have been around about 60 or 70. He jumped straight up and said, boy, say, y'all about to get out of here, say, that lady come out of that store and blow y'all brains out. This is Mold Wright. I am the author of Emmett Lewis Till. Sunday morning, about 2.30, someone called at the door and i said who is it and he said this is mr brian i want to talk with you and the boy and when i opened the door there was a man standing with a pistol in, in one hand and a flashlight in the other hand and he asked me did I have two boys there from Chicago? I told my house. And he said, I want it. I want the boy that done all that talk. They marched him to the car and they asked someone there, was well, this is the right boy? And the answer was, yeah. And they drove toward money. Four days later, Emmett Till's body was found in the Tallahatchie River. The body was so badly damaged that we couldn't hardly just tell who he was. But he happened to have on a ring with his initials. And that cleared it up. The body was shipped home, back north to Chicago, where Mamie Till Bradley insisted on an open casket funeral. So all the world can see, she said, what they did to my boy. So they're going to show the image of, uh, of his body that was... That was uh, printed in the newspapers, and, and like they say, uh, Julie Bond will say, the narrator of this film will say, just the image was just burned into the, the memories of, of black Americans, a um, young teenage boy. I'm left in this old wide world. Jet Magazine showed Till's corpse. So that was his picture before, and then here Shot comes the, the head. An entire generation of young black people would remember the horror of that photo.
husband of the woman in the store and J.W. Milam, her brother-in-law, were arrested for the murder of Emmett Till. The trial was held in nearby Sumner, Mississippi. Black organizations like the NAACP and the black press worked especially hard to keep the case in the news, to make an example of Southern racism for the world. Well, this is gonna be a big strategy in the civil rights movement. I had covered the courts in many areas of this country, but the Till case was unbelievable. I mean, I just didn't get the sense of being in a courtroom. It was first place segregated. The black press sat at a bridge table far off from the uh, court. And the boy's mother came down. They sat her there at the bridge table with us. What uh, do you intend to do here today? Uh... To answer any questions that might that the uh, attorneys might ask me to answer. To the how, best... do you think that, uh, how do you think it could possibly be a help to them? I don't know. I mean, just by answering whatever questions that they ask me. Do you have any evidence bearing on this case? I do know that this is my son. The defense argued that the body found tied to the cotton gin fan in the river was so disfigured that it could not be identified as Emmett Till. The trial took five long, hot days. The prosecution's star witness was Till's uncle, Mose Wright, who testified despite threats to his life. He was called up on to, could he see anybody in the courtroom identify anybody in that courtroom that had come to his house that night and got the uh, uh, Emmett Till out. He stood up and there was a tension in the courtroom. And he says in his broken language, Dahi. Dahi, there he is. I really didn't realize uh, how brave my grandfather Mose Wright was, you know. But uh, after I got older, I realized that he was a brave man. He was a mighty brave man to travel back down there, you know, among all those hostile peoples and testify and get him up in court and point his finger at a white man and accuse him of murder. As the trial ended, a defense lawyer told the jury he was, quote, sure every last Anglo-Saxon one of you has the courage to free these men. It took the jury an hour to find the men not guilty. Months later, for a fee of $4,000, Roy Bryant and J.W. Milam told their story to reporter William Bradford Huey. Milam was startled at the belligerent attitude or the fact that young Till didn't appear to be afraid of him. Now, he'd gone and gotten him out of bed and had him in the back of a truck, and young Till never realized the danger he was in. Now, I'm quite sure that he never thought these two men would kill him. And, uh, or maybe he's just in such a strange environment, he doesn't he really just doesn't know what he's up against. And it seems, to a rational mind today, it seems impossible that they could have killed him. But J.W. Milam looked up at me and said, well, when he told me about this white girl he had, he says, my friend, that's what this war is about down here now. He says, that's what we got to fight to protect. And he says, I just looked at him and I said, boy, you ain't gonna never see the sun come up again. I believe that the whole United States is mourning with me. And if the death of my son can mean something to the other unfortunate people all over the world, then for him to have died a hero would mean more to me than for him just to have died. The fact that uh, Emmett Till, a young black man, could be found floating down the river in Mississippi, as indeed many had been done over the years, uh, just set in concrete the determination of people to move forward. All right. so. That's what is going to be one of the sparks of the civil rights movement. And you can imagine, um, maybe you can't, uh, what it must have been like. So, <clears throat> yeah, uh, both of them found not guilty. Their defense is that there's no body, it can't be Emmett Till, and they just say they didn't do it. And you can see 
uh, some of the problems with segregated juries, segregated courtrooms, um, kind of stands in the way of, of justice. Okay, all right, so we're gonna talk more about the uh, civil rights movement later this week. I've got some other video clips I'd like you to watch. Um, the Eyes on the Prize series is fantastic, um, but we'll get, to, we'll get to some of the other developments uh, on Thursday. All right, Eisenhower's gonna give a farewell address. Um, I'm gonna play just briefly this uh, warning that he gives. Actually, you know what, I'm not, because I wanna talk to you about it. You can watch it later, I'll post this uh, link as well. Um, but what he's gonna warn against, this is kind of the thrust of his uh, speech. This is his farewell address. He's leaving after two successful terms as president. He says, in the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence whether sought or unsought by the military industrial complex the potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist what is he talking about well he's talking about this relationship between congress the department of defense and large military corporations right so congress is being funded by large military corporations in the form of campaign contributions right they're donating to their campaigns congress then appropriates money to the Department of Defense. Department of Defense, the United States military then gives tax funded contracts to large military corporations. And in uh, government and politics, we used to call this the Iron Triangle, right? This relationship between uh, corporations, in this case, military corporations, the defense industry, Congress, and then the executive branch department. And they, the argument that Ike is making is they're going to get so kind of focused on each other that they're going to just. Uh, fuel each other to the detriment of the rest of the country. Think of his chance for peace speech, right? Where he said, the cost of our military uh, might is these hospitals and schools and all these other things. So that's what he's talking about. Was he right? Well, let's look at some data. Um, this is from 2019. This is mandatory spending. So this is what we would call entitlements. This is stuff that is already spent. Um, this is every year things that, um, that the government has already guaranteed. Um, the discretionary budget, which is a fraction of that, this is what uh, President Trump requested in 2019. And, and it's similar to presidents before him, right? This is a pretty typical uh, late 20th, early 21st, now we're getting into the first quarter of the 21st century budget. This is what we are spending from our discretionary budget on uh, you know, big ticket items you can see that the military budget takes up a significant amount right so not to be confused with the entire budget right most of the entire budget is these other things but of the discretionary budget that is uh, determined every year which is a huge number over a trillion dollars you can see that over half of it goes to our military when you compare on a global scale uh, military spending you can see that we outspend one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in uh, what year was this? 2016, 2017. The top eight military budgets in the country were less than our military budget in that year, right? <clears throat> now, as a portion of GDP, uh, we're doing a little bit better. Uh, there's some countries that have a much lower GDP or, or have smaller economies and are spending a huge percentage of their budget on uh, military. Uh, see that list here, but we are spending a significant percentage, right? And we have a massive amount of debt. So I'm going to leave you with this cartoon and let you think about this. Was Ike right? If we were in class, this is where we'd get into a discussion uh, and talk about, you know, was he right? Was it a good thing? Was it a bad thing? Uh, is there anything we can do about it? Is there anything we should do about it, right? It says the trillion dollar sacred bowl in the room, the military industrial complex. And you've got down there Republicans and Democrats in the form of elephants and donkeys, uh, looking for money. How can we? How can we do these things that um, you know we need to do in order to make America successful? When in the background, all of the money is being used by the military. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to leave you there for today. Uh, I will post two more lectures this week. There's also some video clips. This is a great chapter. <laughs> these next few chapters are, I think, really high interest. I think we would be having great discussions in class. Um, if you can, try to make it to a Zoom. It's, it's fun to, to see what kind of questions you guys have and, and kind of get into some discussion on this. Um, but if you can't, hopefully these videos are helpful. All right, take care, and I will hopefully 
see you again someday. I've stopped saying soon, but someday. All right, take care.